Good morning. I have Steph Hinnerschitz with me who wrote a couple of books and also very recently a piece in the Washington Post about the history of uh, the Asian American experience, civil rights, discrimination, that kind of thing. So we're going to get into it and try and really understand the, the broader picture and then bring it to today. But before, we'll have Andrew start it off. Hello, nerds. Hello, nerds. <laughs> Nicely done, Steph. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, where are you joining us from? Montgomery, Alabama. Alabama. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm on the uh, on the other side of the country, coming to you from Northern California. And uh, first of all, I wanted to say congrats on the piece in the Washington Post. Thank you. That's Thank pretty you. cool. Yeah. So tell us a little bit uh, about yourself. Who who is Steph Hinnerschitz? Steph Hinnerschitz is a historian. And so right now my position is uh, I'm a research advisor with Air University in Alabama. So that's uh, basically I work for the Air Force and at Maxwell Air Force Base, which is kind of like the headquarters for all uh, professional military education with the Air Force. But uh, before that, I was an assistant professor at Cleveland State University um, and decided to kind of take a, a different route with, with my career. Um, so got my PhD from the University of Maryland in 2013. And my area that I focus on is 20th century U.S. history, and then within that, um, Asian American history. And I became interested in that area. Um, really, my very first semester of grad school, I took a research seminar on the history of American imperialism. And mm. so basically, we had to find a topic to do a research paper on that could become a journal article. And at that point, I was kind of vaguely familiar with the topic, having been a history major, but started to do some research and found a lot of information on um, students from the Philippines who came to the U.S. to study in the early 1900s. And a lot of them came to colleges and universities with uh, scholarships from the United States government. And so the whole idea was for these students to come here, uh, really develop like a patriotic love for the United States, and then go back home and be part of the colonial administration when the Philippines was still a colony of the U.S. But what was really interesting to me is that these students, while they were here in the U.S. on the government's dime, they were building this like anti-imperial, anti-colonialism movement against the U.S. So I thought that was <laughs> really cool <laughs> that they were doing that um, while they were here studying, like when the government was paying for them mm -hmm. to be here. Um, and I just got really, really interested because I had not learned that much in high school or even at the college level about this group of people, about Asian American history in general. Mm. And that kind of was a, a gateway into learning all kinds of things and seeing how much about Asian American history doesn't always make its way into the bigger story of how Amer where America came from and how it got to where we were today. So I was just really interested in this wide swath of history that I know I didn't learn much about um, in high school or, or even college or even in you know some of my graduate level classes. So that's that's who I am, um, historian, and I'm really interested in in Asian American history and what it can kind of reveal to us about our country's background in general. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, I, I certainly remember briefly in history class, um, you know, there was touching on the railroad construction, brief mention of the Chinese Exclusion Act. But mm -hmm. for, for the most part, I think a lot of us could summarize what we learned about the Asian American 
kind of history, maybe in half a page, you know, a few bullet points. Yeah, uh, yeah. certainly less so than than other areas. And I, I'm curious. I'm guessing that's just a demographic thing, where as a percentage of the population, Asian Americans weren't a large number or material number, maybe until quite recently. Or what? What? What are your thoughts? Why do you think it's been disproportionately kind of undercovered? So, like you, um, I was actually talking to someone the other day. We were having a conversation about what's how could we have gone so long with knowing mm. so little um, about about Asian Americans and the Asian American experience. And I also remember in my, my high school textbook, we got to World War II, uh, one little paragraph about Japanese American incarceration and right. it shared like the same subsection with the Holocaust, which mm. that's like, <laughs> there's a lot to go mm -hmm. into about like how you group those two things together. Um, but that was, that, was really, that was really it. And part of what, what interests me is the question of why. Why is it that Asian American history is often so left out of the bigger narrative? And um, I think there's some regional differences, uh, you know, on the West Coast, um, especially maybe more recently, there is mm -hmm. perhaps a greater focus on it um, out there on Asian American history because of demographics. Um, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, so especially the area where I grew up, rural, rural Pennsylvania, central, uh, not very diverse at all. So I don't think there was an incentive for a mm -hmm. lot of my teachers to spend a lot of time on Asian American history. Um, I do think even among historians, you know, we, we kind of take topics and make them into subfields. So even if you specialize in American history during the 20th century, we all have our little, our little mm -hmm. area that we kind of get really, really deep into, which is fine. I mean, that's great. But something like Japanese American incarceration. So that's the the book that I have coming out in the fall. That's what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, it has always struck me as I, the more I learned about it, how it's like this piece of history that's pulled out and kind of relegated to that's Asian American history, right? So like Chinese mm -hmm. Exclusion Act, that's Asian American history. Um, Japanese American incarceration, that's Asian American history. And it always seems to be separate that it's a mm. separate kind of highly specialized field. Um, and by not including it in sort of this, uh, the larger history, the larger story of the United States, it's always just separate. It's not really, th there's not a lot of emphasis on what does Asian American history tell us about the United States more generally. Um, it just seems to be kind of this disconnect. And I, you know, demographics, um, you know, probably a part of it. Also just, I think, coming from the history of Asian Americans in the United States itself, this other kind of group, you know, that's the way mm -hmm. immigration laws had worked, um, going way, way back to the 1800s, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. that this is just a community that is separate in some ways um, from the larger story. So I think it, in a really interesting way, it's like the history explains, not not that I agree with it, but it explains why it is that Asian American history is, is left out of the textbooks or gets like one little half page or one paragraph included. Yeah, it reminds me, I remember when I was uh, in college, I was uh, at the supermarket and I, I noticed that all of the Asian kind of oriented food was in this separate aisle and it was called the ethnic aisle. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is this? Like, it's like such a, an interesting way of compartmentalizing and saying, right. well, that's this separate thing. Right. And right. there, you know, there's all this American food. And then we have the ethnic aisle back in the right. corner over there. Right. Right. Um, and I, I also remember when I was uh, first moved to Seattle. I was working with a Japanese American and I didn't really know much about the internment camps other than what I read in kind of American history class. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, his family was living in Seattle. I think he must've been like third generation. Like, so they had been there for a long time, but he was telling me how his, I think it was his parents. Yeah. His parents, like they lost their house and their business. They got moved into an internment camp. But then the neighbor bought the house mm. 
at a really discounted price. Right. And I think there were many cases where the neighbors would do it, kind of hold it on behalf. But in this case, I don't think they were able to get back their house. Yeah. And yeah. it's just like, wow. And this is not like something that happened in the 1800s. This is like, you know, in the middle of the 20th century. Why do you think, um, you know, there hasn't been, the, the, there hasn't been a more kind of acknowledgement of that pretty inhumane treatment of a group who, for all accounts, like didn't do anything wrong. No. They, were, they were just trying to live their life here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's certainly something that I I try and address. And again, I for one of the largest examples, a massive civil rights violation. Like pick, you know, pull out the Constitution pick sort of any amendment and yeah. there it is, right? <laughs> like it's, it was violated um, with, with, you know, executive order 9066. Um, I, when I talk to people, so like when I'm talking to people um, about what I do, when I have conversations with sort of, I mean, just people, I've had people come to lectures who they're not historians, but they're interested mm -hmm. members of the public. They just have not heard a lot about this. They want to know more. Um, the conversations that I have had, it seems like this is incarceration is seen as this like blip in American history. Um, that it was a very unfortunate byproduct of the war. Mm. That I don't run into many people who still say that it, it was okay that it happened, or of course it had to happen because we were at war with Japan. I don't mm -hmm. I don't get that from a lot of people. Um, but the sense that I do get is that it's very easy to see it as just like this anomaly in American history, that it's something that happened. It was terrible that it happened, but it was war and war mm -hmm. makes people do uh, really terrible things. But that was long ago. Um, you get the model minority myth working here where mm. people will say, oh, but look, you know, Japanese Americans bounced back. And by the 60s, 70s, um, some of the most educated people in the country, they made it. Um, it was an unfortunate incident. It's in the past. It was a, a weird sort of side thing with the war. Um, you know, survivors of uh, incarceration got reparations um, in the 80s and early 90s. So I think it's, I think a lot of people, if they know a lot about it or mm. um, have read a lot about it, it's like this done deal. Like it's like this right. little segment that you can just pull out. Um, we addressed it. It's done moving on. And so I think it's just kind of comforting for a lot of people to be like, that was a really terrible thing, but it's, it's over with. Um, right. it's, it's done. I, that's my personal opinion. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was this kind of, I think in, in, the, in their one interpretation is this was a one-off thing. Yes. Um, we're going to give ourselves a mulligan on it and right. you know, everything's fine now. No harm, no foul kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. we're, 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 I'm, I imagine was there similar treatment for um, Germans and Italians during World War II? I mean, we were, technically we were at war with with them as well. That's um, okay. So <laughs> that is a really interesting question, and I have seen other historians use the examples of the experiences of German and Italian Americans during the war, mm -hmm. um, not in good faith. So there are a lot of people who, even if they know that uh, what happened with Japanese Americans during World War II wasn't right, very hesitant to make the connection to racism at all. Um, mm. Not there's there's people who do not want to do that, right? They want to they want to list all the other reasons for it, but don't want to say that it was heavily dependent on racism. And one of the things they usually use as proof or evidence is that you had um, Italian Americans and German Americans on the East and the West Coast mm -hmm. during the war who were under curfew. So they, mm -hmm. they fell under some of the same restrictions and limitations as Japanese Americans did. Um, but this is the key difference. But you don't see mass camps for right. Italian Americans and German Americans to go into. Um, that didn't happen. And so FDR actually lifts the curfew um, for Italian Americans and later German Americans uh, early on. And there's a lot of historians have a lot of different reasons for that. One, 
logistically speaking, um, mm. German Americans, one of the biggest ethnic group in this country at the time, um, mm. followed by Italian Americans. So that's, that's like the logistics explanation. Um, the other explanation is especially places like New York City, especially New York, FDR was getting a lot of pressure um, from Democrats that he needed to keep supporting some of his programs and the New Deal program. So mm -hmm. um, one explanation is also some of these powerful Democrats who are Italian Americans basically said, don't even think about doing what, what you would have done or what you're planning to do with Japanese Americans or we're gonna withhold our support. Mm. Um, Meanwhile, on the West Coast, there were Democratic politicians who were doing the opposite, right? Who were saying, we need something done about the Japanese Americans on the West Coast. We're at risk potentially of another attack. Um, all kinds of racist beliefs about how even American born uh, Japanese mm -hmm. Americans who are citizens are kind of inherently loyal to Japan. So um, there certainly were ways that uh, German Americans and Italian Americans dealt with some of the same things as Japanese Americans. Um, but there were no, they didn't, they didn't spend, you know, years in camps that didn't happen. Yeah. And so you will hear, you'll often hear people um, say, well, the same thing happened to Italian Americans and German Americans. So race didn't play a part in this. It wasn't just about race. Um, no, <laughs> that's yeah. just, that's just, I mean, no race, race was a part of this. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like there certainly weren't camps where Italian Americans and German Americans were were relocated to against their will. Yeah, there yeah. were. So there's another there's another part of this too. Um, so the reason why historians are moving more to calling it incarceration rather than internment mm -hmm. is because an internment camp was um, or an internment facility that was a really specific process that the Department of Justice dealt with. Mm. And so the Department of Justice looked for what they called enemy aliens. So these would be um, German, Italian, Japanese immigrants. So not mm. citizens, but people who were here. Um, and those were nations we were at, you know, at war mm -hmm. with. So the, the Department of Justice dealt with the internment side of things. There's a whole other agency created to deal with American citizens. And here it's predominantly Japanese American citizens. So that's... Uh, because we're talking about the fact that most Japanese Americans who ended up in the camps were citizens, that's no longer internment. That's, yeah. that's incarceration. They're being imprisoned. Um, mm. So there were centers, there were facilities for enemy aliens, but that's, that's separate from right. what, what you know, executive EO 9066 eventually led to. How did the uh, how did the Chinese Americans fare in all of this? Did they get grouped up, or were they kind of left alone, or how did that go? Yeah. Down? So I I have read about some instances where there were um, kind of like mistakes made uh -huh. for Chinese Americans who kind of got swept up in this, um, and then I I I believe it it kind of worked out, understanding uh -huh. that there was a mistake that was made um, when they were allowed to go. Chinese Americans generally speaking, um, saw this as an opportunity to kind of really separate themselves from the Japanese American community. Um, so like in Chinatown in San Francisco, like patriotism kind of overload, right? Ch the Chinese American community really just, you know, we're allies with the United States. We are not Japanese Americans. Uh -huh. um, we're not them. Don't confuse us with them. And I mean, that I really... <laughs> really worked hard to use the war as an opportunity um, mm. to kind of prove their patriotism and set themselves apart from Japanese Americans. Um, some Filipino American communities in the US did the same thing. So other Asian American groups took advantage of this um, and you know, to, to see a moment where maybe they could be seen as more American um, mm. and try and move into to more acceptance and tolerance than they had before the war. So there's there's a lot of um, kind of inter-ethnic division going on at the time doesn't mean across the board that um, all Chinese Americans um, or all Filipino Americans did this, but there was it was a kind of like a moment of opportunity in that case. Yeah, it's a shame. I mean, you it would have been a really interesting thing to see uh, the various <clears throat> Asian American communities kind of stick up for the uh, 
the Japanese Americans mm -hmm. because, yeah. uh, you know, in a, in a, in many ways, you know, what they left the old country behind. So mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a new beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, at growing up, uh, as a son of, uh, of Chinese immigrants, I, I appreciate there was some, some hard feelings between China and Japan during yes. World War II. Yeah. 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 So I have a question from Ethan uh, in the audience. He was saying, hey, I was watching Tombstone, which is, an old, uh, well, I think it's an old Western movie. And uh, he was saying there was a mention of an anti-Chinese league or something like that. And he was wondering, like, was there, was there actually organized efforts back in the day uh, around sort of the Chinese presence or Chinese American community or, um, you know, experience here? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So like the anti-Chinese league, um, probably like a, a generic stand in for a lot of different leagues <laughs> at this mm. time. So in the late 1800s um, and even into the early 1900s, if you go you know, out to the West, um, there were a lot of uh, it, it's kind of called at the time frontier justice. And so mm. what it really was were these kind of like vigilante groups. Um, who joined together, and there were a lot of a lot of anti-Chinese laws uh, passed, and pretty much as soon as Chinese immigrants started to arrive in the U.S. to work on the railroads, to work in mining, and so there were, I mean, all kinds of discriminatory and, and racist laws, extra taxes placed on Chinese miners, um, Chinese businesses were expected to pay kind of exorbitant fines, and so there's all these ways for Chinese Americans to be kind of criminalized. And so you mm. have a lot of these like anti-Chinese leagues. Um, there's all kinds of like secret orders, different groups that pop up. The sole purpose being one to kind of police the Chinese when there wasn't always like a formal law enforcement presence. So they kind of took it upon themselves to do that. And then also to try and build support for some sort of federal exclusion of the Chinese. Um, so, and then the, the part about bipartisan, so I, I'm, you know, who was kind of behind the movement mm. against the Chinese Democrats or Republicans, um, initially the Republicans at the time. So we're, we're talking like right before the Chinese exclusion act in 1882, um, Republicans tended to steer away from taking any kind of harsh stance against Chinese immigrants because they wanted to maintain good diplomatic ties with China for trade. Mm. Uh, meanwhile, you had a lot of Democrats in the West, especially in California, who are getting a lot of power by representing sort of the white working class man. And they're kind of mm -hmm. calling for the opposite and accusing the Republicans of being um, elitist and not caring about what's happening to the white working class man who has to compete with the Chinese for jobs. So mm. it, like two different levels going on there. Um, with that question, like, yeah, Chinese exclusion uh, did in a lot of ways become kind of bipartisan, but then also, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of leagues that that pop up um, in all kinds of different communities in the West where there's a Chinese presence. Um, and the point being to kind of go from community to community, eventually kind of drive them out, but to to kind of target um, Chinese immigrants. And, and they laid the, the framework for moving against other immigrant groups as well later on. Yeah, it's a good question. What was the rationale for the Chinese Exclusion Act? I mean, that was uh, an act that said what well, basically you couldn't have people immigrate from China anymore. Was it was it mainly um, it sounds like it might have been a combination of the labor pressure mm -hmm. um, or were there also like cultural concerns? Because um, I, I I seem to recall reading that even before that, I don't think Chinese women were allowed to yeah. immigrate. Yeah, no, yeah, it's it's a big it's a big mix of things. So yeah, what yeah. you're talking about, you're absolutely right. So the 18 there was an act passed in 1875, mm. um, which uh, made it pretty much illegal for Chinese women to come into the United States, and that's all wrapped up with this belief that uh, most Chinese women who come to the U.S. are prostitutes. 
And so that's this idea that to keep America kind of moral, and there's always an element of people who say, but we're just looking out for the interest of the Chinese women who come here and they fall prey to these evil people and they become prostitutes. But it's this very stereotypical idea that um, Chinese American, or not Chinese American women, women from China mm. are just kind of naturally prone to falling into this very kind of wicked way of life. So even before the Chinese Exclusion Act, you already have some laws on the books that are trying to discourage the Chinese from coming here. Um, also in California, uh, anti-opium laws are passed. So trying to kind of target all these behaviors that become part of a national conversation about why the Chinese need to be excluded. So on one hand, you are right, cultural ideas, all of these very racist ideas that um, the Chinese are diseased and mm. filthy and prone to all kinds of sicknesses and um, immorality, the age old trope in the United States that um, Chinese men are out to get white women, they want to kidnap them and sell them into prostitution, um, just w wicked, immoral group of people. So that's that's one side of this. And then the other side is the labor aspect of this. And so um, the Chinese Exclusion Act really targets manual laborers. So if you are a merchant, a student, any kind of like diplomatic member, mm -hmm. um, or there's another one, I think a religious official, you're allowed to come into the United States. So if you're any of those groups and you're coming from China, that's fine. But Chinese manual laborers, no. Um, that group is excluded because of the, the idea that there's labor competition. So it's this, it's this mess of kind of very racist stereotypes um, combined with this call that America needs to be protected from economic competition. And it's, it's, it's really complex. And kind of when you start to pull one string out and you're like, okay, mm. so what led to the Chinese Exclusion Act? You pull one string, others start to come out and it's, it's kind of all wrapped up with a lot of different things that's that are going on in America at the time. Yeah, so it's a mix it's a mix of both and they kind of yeah. feed into each other. You know, your your discussion of the narrative around well, hey, these these Chinese, you know, they're they're bringing all their vices and their opium and their gambling and prostitution and disease and all you you almost it rings sort of like familiar with like oh, they're not sending their best people. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes, that's, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like you hear all this, um, you know, it, it doesn't make me happy sometimes mm. as a historian when I feel like my field of study is very relevant. That's, mm. <laughs> that's usually not, I'm like, Ooh, that's not a good thing. So during um, the Trump administration, all, you know, a lot of the things that, that he was saying and, and other people were saying, it definitely, it definitely ran like this is we've been here before. And I feel like that's what a lot of immigration historians and Asian American historians are trying to are trying to do at this moment to basically mm. say we've been here before. Like there's a pattern here um, and it's it just keeps going and going. And you, you need to you need to stop and, and learn that learn that history. And so, yeah, hearing these ideas or these thoughts that nations where immigrants are coming from, they're not the, the best. Um, that's mm -hmm. certainly something that's repeated a lot. And you hear it, it, you know, throughout American history. So it's a little frustrating sometimes if you're a historian and you specialize in immigration or Asian American history, or I mean, a lot of history in America, <laughs> you're kind yeah. of, you feel like no one's listening to you. Like you've been s saying this stuff for a long time and no one is listening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is so sad how hist history does seem to repeat itself, um, you know, and uh, we, we keep having to relearn that lesson. Um, yeah. Tell me a little <laughs> bit about assimilation, because I, I kind of feel like part of the contribution of the lack of understanding is that I, I, I do think that there were a lot of Asian Americans, especially in the um, you know, mid 1900s and, and, you know, late 20th century who tended to just say like, Hey, I'm going to like, take my dad. He was an engineer. He would get on the train and go to New York and work on his civil engineering stuff, come home, 
and we'd have dinner and we'd kind of keep to ourselves. Like yeah. he wasn't, he wasn't going to, uh, you know, the PTA meetings or he wasn't going to the little league games. Um, partly, I think it was a challenge with language, but I think partly that wasn't sort of how he was raised so that, mm -hmm. that, you know, there was this broader, um, kind of fabric that you want to integrate into. And I'm curious, have, do, when you look at the history of other immig immigrant communities, do you see, some, you know, how much does that contribute to where we are today? Because it could be that just people just don't even talk to to other groups enough. And then there's this, you know, lack of an understanding. I Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at um, ethnic history in the United States, you mm -hmm. look at immigration history, there are a lot of a lot of groups who who did the same thing, who mm. kind of, who saw, you know, making, a, a, achieving economic success to kind of filter down to their children and the next generations. Um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty common American experience, um, mm. I, I would say. But going back to like this idea of the model minority I, myth that this is, you know, Asian Americans are the model minority because they overcame adversity and they're economically successful um, and they're thoroughly assimilated. And so how could they possibly be discriminated against? And I think I made, um, not getting too off topic, but I think I, I commented on, on one of your tweets when you had retweeted mm -hmm. uh, the op-ed and I saw two comments from people who had a hard time kind of accepting that there was racism at all in mm. any of the more recent attacks on Asian American or that there was sort of a broad pattern of anti-Asian hate. And I got, I got a sense that they were making those claims without explicitly mentioning this idea of the model minority myth, mm -hmm. but also kind of mention it, right? To say that there's, you know, these are people, they're being attacked by people who are jealous of their success or what's going on today isn't like it was in the past. Like there's night and day between the Chinese Exclusion Act and what's going on now. And so, mm. uh, you know, this idea of, of assimilation, it's often, I think, um, used against Asian Americans. Like it's this weird double-edged sword where it's it's kind of easily used to dismiss any racism discrimination that Asian Americans might face because it's it's easy to say, no, they made it, right? It can mm -hmm. possibly be racism. They're economically successful, right? I mean, they go to Ivy right. schools, blah, 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 all this stuff. And so then it's it's kind of pushed aside and it's seen as something that's like explicitly Asian American of working very hard to be assimilated and achieve success. And, you know, again, throughout American history, that's a lot of immigrant groups did that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's part of like this American story, but it's, it's used as, as a, a political tool. With yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like saying there's no such thing as anti-Semitism because Jewish Americans have done well, you know, in, yeah. in, in a academia and, and in, in, in business. Um, right, I'm right. guessing there probably still is some anti-Semitism out there despite yes. that. Um, one, one thing I'm curious about Steph is the relationship between Asian American and other minority groups in America, because mm -hmm. it feels like, uh, historically the groups have been kind of, um, segregated mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's, you know, the African-American civil rights movement. And then there's, you know, Hispanic, you know, American, you know, advocacy and then Jewish defense league. And then, you know, whatever happens on the Asian American side. And I wonder like, what's the history of like, you would think there should be more, um, shared interests to mm -hmm. kind of advocate for fairness you know, irrespective of background, but I don't really see that as much. Mm -hmm. And certainly with the um, sort of current kind of Asian American hate stuff, you do see instances where it's not always a rich white person shooting, you know, an, a an Asian American person. It's, it's sometimes within the minority groups. Mm -hmm. And what was curious, what's your observation on how these different strands, why don't they're not more interwoven? Mm -hmm. 
when you know if you if you pick up or you read a lot of stuff that's being written um, by all kinds of people, right? So not just historians, but scholars, activists across the board about what's going on um, right now with with uh, anti Asian hate. You'll see you'll see the the phrase white supremacy thrown around a lot, mm -hmm. and there's a reason why. Right? <laughs> there's a reason why that phrase is used, and it it helps to explain some of what you described. Um, why is it that in a lot of different instances, you see different ethnic or racial groups that um, are discriminated against and have been discriminated against through laws and social means and economic means. Why isn't that they that they can't always come together and look at the common enemy, which is racism? Um, white supremacy is really good uh, <laughs> at making sure that that does not happen, right? Because um, it's like a lot of a lot of different ethnicities and races in this country because of the history, because of the very racialized history of this country, this idea that being white or as close to white as possible can get you certain things, can help you survive. It's a way to kind of navigate the system. And so like if, if everyone kind of looks at that, you go way back, right? 1800s, um, early 1900s. If that's if, if that's part of the system, if white Americans are kind of driving the system um, based on some pretty racist supremacist ideas, mm -hmm. then a lot of groups orient to that for the, I mean, for sheer survival, right? For right. trying to make it, for trying to pull ahead. Um, so that's, that's a driving, that's a driving factor. You do have moments um, where you see groups from across different ethnicities and races um, come together. So in the late 60s, you can see the rise of a of an Asian rights movement um, where you have, especially on the West Coast, but also in New York, a lot of uh, young Asian American students are going to college. They're kind of exposed to ideas about imperialism, um, exploitation, the history of white racism in America. And so they feel a connection um, with other groups. Um, Latinos and mm -hmm. um, African Americans, Native Americans, and they can kind of pull together and identify what are the big themes, what are the big systems that are keeping um, a lot of people down. Uh, but then you you also have just that bigger bigger white supremacist system in this country where it's that's how you get ahead. Um, that's what it means to hold power is mm. to be white. And if that's kind of the driving factor, then you are going to see uh, kind of disintegrating interracial, interethnic relations. And right. what you had mentioned more recently, um, I have certainly experienced this when I've had conversations with people. It's like this like this gotcha moment, right? If you If you say, okay, so there have been a swath of... Uh, verbal and physical assault on Asian Americans. Um, then it's it's like people say, oh, but wait, right? One of them was an African American, mm -hmm. so it could possibly be about race because you have, uh, you know, an African American man who assaulted an Asian mm -hmm. American. It's like it's almost like they found something like that, mm -hmm. right? It's not about race, um, but it's it's another way I think that. A lot of Americans try and move away from this idea that there's any connection to race here, because that couldn't possibly be the case if you have these different, if, if you have an instance where you live in a more diverse community and mm. you have someone who's not white, um, who also engages in verbal and physical abuse of Asian Americans, that's part of a bigger story. I mean, that's part of look at look at the communities and other scholars have brought this up. Um, look at the communities where this happens. You have a very diverse community that's suffering from things like poverty, lack of services. Um, there's all kinds of things that feed into this. It's, it doesn't excuse, it doesn't kind of explain away racism from anything like this. It's, it's a fact in American life that there are communities that are kind of struggling. So this, I, you know, the, the history of interracial, interethnic cooperation in American history, um, it's really, it's really complex. And white supremacy explains a lot of it, not all of it, but it yeah. explains <laughs> interestingly enough, my, uh, my, br one of my brothers is, uh, is a Trump, big Trump supporter. And he, he's, I like talking to him because I learn about the narrative that he hears because he doesn't read, mm 
um, what he calls mainstream media. So he right. consumes a lot of Trump media. Right. And so I was saying, tell, I was thinking, you know, well, finally, we have an issue that he and I can agree on that, yeah. you know, violence against Asian Americans, especially elderly Asian Americans, is just, yeah. you know, unacceptable. And he was very quick to remind me that, oh, no, you know, I, I'm going to send you a link to a video of a Hispanic man that pushed an older Asian man over. And, uh, and I was like, wait a minute, I'm not here attacking like some white power structure. I'm just saying elderly Asian, Amer Asian American people should not be harmed by whoever. Right. And the yeah, fact that right. you have an yeah. example of a Hispanic person doing this does not negate the fact that action needs to be taken. And right. I think the media he listens to always orients it as an attack on white culture. And I was like, I don't, whatever, white culture is fine. It's great. Every culture, culture has cool things about it. Right. But, you know, this is not always about your, you know, you feeling like white culture is being attacked. It's it's more about let's stick up for, for people who are being um, mistreated by right. whoever. Right. But it does seem to get conflated that, when you say, hey, I want to stop Asian American hate, um, a lot of people interpret that as, oh, you're you're blaming me. You're blaming my white culture. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't, whatever is the blame, like this is a problem we need to solve. Yep, yep. And do, do you, are you, is that your observation? Like, how do we get out of that? Because it seems like a competition of who can show the most grievance and and it's not about problem solving. Yeah, it's uh, and and you know what's interesting? Um, I was reading the other day some of of what people who testified um, or who spoke before the House about what can be done about this because mm -hmm. it's a lot of people say it's we're reaching a crisis point with this now, mm. um, and there are groups and in 2019 who were screaming right, and then especially when you get to like March 2020, that this is a problem, and that there's there's a lot of verbal attacks here, and if we don't address this now, mm -hmm. um, things are going to get bad. And so I was reading uh, some of of the resolutions or some things that a lot of activists want to be done, and there's not a lot of people who are who are saying um, just Asian Americans, right? That like, okay, we need things that are just going to address this issue only for Asian Americans. Most of the things that I'm reading, most of the things that activists are kind of calling for are these broad programs that could address a lot of issues for a lot of different groups. Um, so thinking about things like poverty, or uh, you know, access to bilingual sources, or mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at things like the the deportation of um, Vietnamese, like more recently that happened, I think like two weeks ago, who have been in this country for generations and mm. or uh, decades, and then they get deported. So, I don't, I don't really even see um, a lot of the things that I read people kind of standing up and saying, oh, this is just for Asian Americans, right? Like this is, we need to solve this problem just for Asian Americans. Um, what they're asking for is to see what's going on right now with Asian Americans as part of the bigger conversation about what do we do about minorities? What do we do about people who are struggling? What do we do um, to, to make sure that Americans and politicians uh, understand that the struggles of Asian Americans is in a lot of ways the same struggle for a lot of groups. Um, and to kind of push past this model minority idea that Asian Americans no longer have problems with racism and discrimination. So sort of that's, I think that's an interesting thing that maybe like your brother might not necessarily read or hear about, mm -hmm. um, depending on the resources where if you do read, uh, you know, newspapers or news outlets that aren't part of mainstream media, um, to use that phrase, uh, mm -hmm. you probably won't see that, right? You're not going to see the fact that activists are calling for kind of like broad reforms and for asking, they're asking for recognition that Asian Americans share the same issues in a lot of cases. You're probably, you're not going to see that. So what you're going to see is this kind of attack on, um, you know, oh, it's, it's all white Americans. And uh, what about this group? What about that group? But, but the reality is that a lot of, you know, a lot of the people who have spoke before Congress and who are asking for help, they're asking to be recognized and to be included um, in some of the bigger conversations about what do we do about racism 
and discrimination in this country. So I, I think that's something that maybe maybe people don't realize or don't understand about what's going on with these conversations. And I don't think people might get that necessarily from, from all different news outlets. Yeah. Yeah. I think the news outlets he consumes are always about, Oh, here they go again, attacking, attacking the, the, the system and blaming, uh, blaming, you know, sort of white people for all the problems in the world. And, and uh, hopefully we can find some, more nuance to that yeah. debate. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's very, uh, it's it's so, it kind of um, oversimplifies things uh, on either side, you know. Um, one, one other thing I was curious about, Steph, is, you know, this notion of the model minority. What I've learned growing up and, and having encounters now with people from all different backgrounds um, is, Yes, there are certainly many Asian Americans who have done really well and and achieved a lot. There's also a a significant part of the Asian American community that lives in poverty, mm -hmm. and they are not going to MIT and right. Princeton. You know, they are mm -hmm. they are laborers, and they are working in restaurants or they're working mm -hmm. in uh, nail salons or whatever, and they're the. Do you do you feel like there's going to be more kind of um awareness of of the of that sort of um kind of part of the asian american community and and have you observed like how do you see that because it almost seems like there's two asian american communities there's the ultra achiever class that's doing really well but then there's there's a, a, another group of asian americans that we don't rare, rarely talk about that is not doing well at all right right which you know what I was thinking about this as you were talking. I think this mm. is really interesting because you said there's there's different class, right? right. There's different classes among yeah. among the Asian American community. And we, we do this all the time when we talk about white Americans, right? We do this as middle class, there's mm -hmm. upper class, there's mm -hmm. the white working class, there's the so we do we we pick apart, right? Like the experiences of white Americans constantly. It's used constantly in politics. The fact that we don't seem to see the same thing among mm. Asian Americans is explained in a lot of ways by this idea that a lot of people have kind of internalized um, because of stereotypes in movies and, and TV shows and this idea, the, the things that people say about how successful um, Asian Americans are. And there's certain, I mean, there is success, but just like there's successful white people who are mm. wealthy, um, there's also a heck of a lot of poor white people. Um, but a lot, I mean, we don't sort of address that, but I think, I hope that now is a time when perhaps we'll kind of move away from that. But, you know, I do, as a historian, um, I hope that changes. <laughs> um, in the late 1970s, uh, the U S civil rights commission held its for in the history of its creation since the late forties, they held their first, uh, like session just for Asian Americans. So this is like 1979. Mm. Um, and they invited Asian American activists and scholars, a lot of different people to come to DC and basically consult the Civil Rights Commission on what kind of problems does the Asian American community face, right? We haven't mm -hmm. really addressed that a lot. So you have all of these, all of these different people from the Asian American community. And one by one, you know, they're saying, hey, poverty, right? Refugees from Vietnam mm -hmm. and other Southeast Asian countries who are fleeing from the wreckage of the war. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea of the model minority myth, it's not real, right? I mean, you've got, at the time, you had a lot of um, Asian American women who are, you know, the kind of the sole breadwinners of a household. Mm -hmm. They're struggling just like other women are in other groups. And they just kind of poured all this data and statistics out. Um, and yet, right, like, and yet kind of that that didn't stick because still today we're we're dealing with that, the idea of the model minority myth. Now, you know, hopefully with things like social media, with ways that different activist groups can connect, maybe that will stick, right? Maybe we'll see a, a place where that model minority myth is kind of chipped away at, mm -hmm. um, I hope, but it's it's really sad to see to see that pattern, right? Where you, you kind of have the same thing, I think it was March 18th, where you 
had, again, members of the Asian American community who testified before the House about mm. what could be done. Um, the same thing happened in 1979, and there was hope, right? There was hope that like this might lead to some more resources being directed to the Asian American community. And then in 1982, uh, you have the murder of Vincent Chin, and mm -hmm. you have uh, anti-Japanese sentiment once uh, Japan sort of really became an economic competitor. And it's like a hundred years, it, it's like you can't really tell the difference between the Chinese Exclusion Act in 82, and then mm. exactly, you know, 100 years later, you have Vincent Chin. And it's like, it's at some point that pattern needs to stop. At some point, politicians can't just pay lip service to the Asian American community and say, yeah, we hear you. Okay, we're going to do a lot mm -hmm. to take care of this. And then we go back to square one, right? And the, and the representation isn't there. So another thing that hopefully this changes is more representation among Asian Americans in Congress, um, you know, kind of people to to hold politicians to the promises that they make, right? To hold Biden to, okay, you sign this executive order and we stood in front of the United, you know, the U United States people in this address that you gave and mm -hmm. said how terrible um, anti-Asian discrimination is. But like to actually stick with that and to look at the yeah. problems. So. Yeah, and for those who... Um may not be familiar i think the case with vincent chin was when there was a lot of anxiety among um domestic uh automaker uh workers about mm -hmm. competition from toyota and honda and nissan and uh i guess was was this in in detroit mm -hmm. is that yeah. where yeah yeah and so yeah. i'm of course the sad irony is that like no, Vincent Chin's not, he's, he has nothing to do with Nissan or Datsun or Toyota. No. I mean, if anything, yeah. his yeah. parents, his grandparents are probably at war with the Japanese. Right. Um, yeah. 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 And so that, yeah, that, that's this grouping, right? Like all Asians, like you just kind of um, get kind of lumped together and mm -hmm. you, you would not be surprised. I think now, even with the anger about the COVID-19 stuff, I've seen cases of Filipino Americans and Korean Americans being attacked mm -hmm. and you know, they have nothing to do with the Chinese communist party mm -hmm. furthest mm -hmm. thing from it. Yep. Um, it's, I guess, th 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 was that kind of, this is just not nothing new. Like we've seen this before, I guess. That's yeah. The point. Yeah. It's, it's, we have, and it's, um, you know, I mean, really you, you kind of chart it out. It's there, right. The pattern is there where, uh, the, the racism, the stereotypes against mm. Asian Americans, they don't go away. They might like kind of dormant, although, you know, you have Asian Americans who experience this kind of, uh, Race and racism discrimination every day, right? Not when it's just a national crisis, but this is part of part of the the experience. And then you see sort of an economic crisis or some kind of political crisis, and then like just like that, all these things come yeah. to the surface again. And it's just like so. It's it's an indication. Like if we're going to use historic examples as our evidence, right? It's an indication that there, there is something always there, that like at the turn of a hat, right? Something goes wrong and Asian Americans are scapegoated. Like it's mm. always, it's just there. Um, and that's, that's a problem, right? That's a problem. And as a historian, like I, I can't solve, <laughs> I yeah. can't solve everything. Um, but I do know that if you if you kind of take it down and you're like it's it's overwhelming to think like how can I end Asian American hate right that's that's an it could be an overwhelming thing as as one person to think of no matter mm -hmm. what race or ethnicity um, you belong to um, but you know a question for teachers who might be out there you know if there are any like high school or, or elementary school teachers even right like okay so in my textbook there's no mention of uh, or like one sentence about Chinese exclusion mm -hmm. or a paragraph about Japanese American incarceration. What can you do, right? Maybe you bring in a document or a source. Maybe you kind of start and, and bring Asian American history back into the story so that people understand how far this goes back. And that's, you know, like as a historian, I think that's, I believe a lot in sort of the power of, of education and learning about things that you don't necessarily uh, always know about. So I think, um, you know, I think knowing the history isn't going to solve everything, but I think it can go a long way 
in understanding just how sort of deep this problem is and then chipping away at the whole model minority idea, I think. Why do you think when, like when Japan um, became a much stronger economic force in the 80s, and uh, clearly there was a lot of anti-Asian stuff going on mm -hmm. that, you know, with the Vincent Chin and all, all those kinds of things. Um, and now with China's economic kind of rise, you see a lot of anxiety and, and anger about that. But I don't feel like I saw that when like Germany and the EU started picking things up. And I mean, the German GDP is really impressive. And the, mm -hmm. uh, or Russia's kind of rise in foreign kind of international influence as an adversary. Mm -hmm. but you don't you don't see like a lot of anti-Russian or anti-German vibe. Why do you why do you think that's the case? Um, I, I mean, I just think uh, it's very, it's very easy um, to use different ethnic and minority groups as sort of scapegoats. The pattern, mm -hmm. the pattern is there. And I mean, of course, like you, not to boil everything down to like, you know, white versus everyone mm -hmm. else, but you know, like there's a, there's a common denominator here. If like, you know, you don't see bumper stickers, right. That are like, mm -hmm. had that have anti-German sentiment. Um, you don't see, you know, like anti-Russian <laughs> sentiment. So it's, there's no, there's no real pattern for that. Mm. Um, in this country, the, the pattern, um, we look at the people who we don't think should be here that are representative of where it is that they came from. Uh, whereas, you know, German Americans, Italian Americans have been here for a long time. So they're not, you know, they're not part of, of that over there. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing to be concerned about. Asian Americans, um, Latinos have also been here a really long time. But it's this idea that, oh, well, they're, you know, they don't, they're not American. They don't belong here. They represent um, something different, something that's not easily kind of assimilated into this country. Um, you know, if you look at World War II, I'm certainly not saying that there was not anti-German sentiment. Not at all, right? I mean, Germany was our was our enemy, but the overall emphasis was on anti-Japanese. And mm. you know, you do have Pearl Harbor; it's there, but it's you know, you can kind of like think about this throughout American history. Why is it this group and not that group? Um, and as a historian, and and looking at what other scholars have said, it's this idea that Asian Americans are kind of like these perpetual outsiders. Um, they mm. have not been fully seen as being fully American. And when you have a when you have a history of the nation passing legislation um, to prevent Asian immigrants from coming here, that creates this idea that they're easily expendable, they're easily excludable, that they're just not part Mm. of the fabric as other groups are. So I, I I think that's that's why, right? You don't see a lot of anti whatever from other economic competitors. It's just yeah. not it's not there. It's not there. Yeah. Uh I know we're a little over time, but I, I had to ask you about the history of Asian Americans in um uh, the US government. I mean th this audience and this channel was started because Andrew Yang decided to run for president. Uh, and it was a, as an Asian American, I was like, Whoa, like my dad would never believe that there's a Chinese American dude running for president. Right. And yet, you know, he, he got pretty far. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I moved from the East coast to the West coast, my mom was shocked. I was like, hey, you know the governor of Washington State, this guy Gary Locke? Like, he's a Chinese American. And then San Francisco later on had uh, the first Asian American mayor of San Francisco. So, uh, what's your read on Asian American participation in elected office and, and government? Because it didn't seem like there was a lot of it until, you know, the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, I mean, you, you did have representatives beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. going actually back to, I'm going to say like the 1920s, 1930s, now not in huge numbers, but they right. were there. Um, and there have, been, there have been some historians who are doing some really good work on what kind of potential Asian, the Asian American community has 
in terms of being like a, a really strong voting bloc. So the mm. idea that whatever party gets to the Asian American vote, that's kind of, that might be a very important factor, right, in the next couple of elections. And so um, there's another historian, Jane Hong, who's writing a history of Asian American evangelicals um, mm. and Asian American members of the Republican Party. And sort of, you know, what what that might look like, um, how that might shape things if there's more conservative Asian Americans in federal government as representatives. You know, like what what would that mean for the Asian American community? What kind of conversations would they be having? What kind of what kind of pool might they have? Whereas if you have um, Asian American liberal representatives uh, mm -hmm. in Congress, what might that look like? And so I I think it's interesting to see that representation is slowly growing, right? It's growing there, but it's becoming part, I think it's good, right? It's becoming part of this national conversation about conservative, liberal, the kind, the kind of conversations that make Americans know that the Asian American community is not this monolithic group, right? Mm -hmm. That like a lot of the same issues affect them as affect any other group. So I think, um, I think it'll be interesting to see sort of where the community, the community goes. There are a lot of, uh, you know, the Vietnamese American community, many of them voted for Trump, right? And sort mm. of went, went to Trump. There's that anti-communist sort right. of- Right, like almost like the Cuban Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's, it's gonna be very interesting to see sort of what, where the representation falls and what that means for, you know, some of the things that Asian American activists are calling for today right, in, in Congress, asking for help with dealing with this. Um, so that's, I mean, that's sort of, I think that's that's gonna be interesting to see where it where it goes, for sure. Yeah, I mean, and then there's like a great kind of call to action for the Asian American community to the extent that um, more Asian Americans could register to vote, uh, participate actively in mm -hmm. the process uh, you know, sad to say, but I think a lot of politicians care about votes and getting reelected more than anything else. So yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. If, <laughs> if a community can swing and you can be, if the Asian American community can be like the Joe Manchin of elections, you know, here's like, it doesn't, you know, sometimes it takes a small group mm -hmm. and they can swing things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, demographically, I think the Asian American community is growing in the U S but I think it is also behind in yeah. engagement in the political process, which is why, you know, the the Yang kind of run for president and now mayor of NYC could be like a really interesting inflection point where you're yeah. going to see maybe more people running for Congress and, yeah. and senator and that kind of thing. Do you do you feel like that's likely to happen? I know you're a historian. Maybe we could focus on like you mentioned there has been Asian American representation in elected office since, you know, the early 20th century. It seems to me like there's more, like it's picking up or, or is that just kind of my perception is what's your take? No, it, it definitely is right. It definitely is. And I think um, not to, it, it sounds oversimplified, but I, mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely true. Um, you know, representation matters. If you, if you see, Asian American mm -hmm. politicians kind of breaking into things. It doesn't right. seem like it's something that's un unobtainable. You know, like you were talking about your dad, mm -hmm. um, the idea of the possibility, like, uh, you know, an Asian American guy running for president, that possibility is there. You know, that's something that might seem incredibly mind blowing to him, but you know, like other generations, if they kind of grow up seeing, right. at least seeing Asian Americans, more Asian Americans run for office, it won't seem so um, unobtainable or unique or, you know, extraordinary. It'll be something that's much more, much more common. Um, same thing, like, you know, as you get more, as you had more women run for office, mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't seem so weird or unobtainable if, if you just, if you see it more. So I think, I think the pattern is going to kind of increase. I think it'll be interesting to see how the political scene kind of kind of shakes out. So I do think it is picking up, and I I do think I think candidates like Yang are 
are going to do a lot for that in terms of just being able to see Asian Americans make a run for office, all kinds of different um, political positions for sure. Steph, before we wrap up, was there anything else that we didn't touch on that you wanted to bring up about um, the, this topic? I feel like we covered a lot of ground. <laughs> we did, didn't we? <laughs> um, I think we did. So, I mean, I, I just appreciate, um, you know, the opportunity to kind of, to kind of be here when you write an op-ed, it's the nature of op-eds that you, you have limited space and you, mm -hmm. you don't get the chance to kind of go into everything. So, you know, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to jump on this opportunity <laughs> when you invited me, I'm like, all right, cool. This is a way to, to get a little bit more into the things that I, I didn't have room to necessarily say. So, I think I'm good, but I really enjoyed doing this. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, let me just say, I really appreciate you uh, taking an interest in this topic because I think in some ways, if you, if it came from an Asian American historian, there would always be a concern like from other kind of people like, oh, well, that that's just someone kind of being uh, aggrieved for their own group. I mean, the fact that you've taken time for your career to focus on this is really um, very uh, inspiring and, and, and really, I'm really uh, grateful because I think you're helping shine a light on this topic in a way that, um, you know, frankly, people who look like me can't because there's mm -hmm. always going to be like, well, are, are they, he's just kind of advocating for his own interests kind of thing. So thank you for taking uh, you know, your time and effort and, and years of study to to increase awareness and understanding of this really complex issue. And I'm I'm grateful that uh, you're continuing to work on it. And maybe uh, when's your book coming out, by the way? It's going to be out in September, uh, late September, early October. For All sure. right. Well, we'll, we'll uh, can we get you uh, when you're on your book tour? Can we get you as a guest to come back and and dig into it? Absolutely. Yep. For I sure. love it. Sure. I love it. So uh, have a great rest of your weekend. And um, with that, we're going to say goodbye, nerds. Goodbye, nerds. <laughs> <laughs>